My name is Jim Smith. I'm a partner, uh, as Orrin mentioned, with Stereo Capital. At Stereo, we are also a growth stage investor, investor. And our particular thesis is around finding companies that have appreciating sales and marketing efficiency metrics. And I'm delighted to be here today with uh, one of the people who I think is one of the true lights in the venture business, uh, Tom Tonguz. Tom's a partner at Redpoint Ventures uh, and has been so for over a decade. And he's been writing about the importance of metric-driven investing and end operations um, and, and enlightening readers really as to the underlying dynamics of technology businesses for many years. Um, and, and I've thoroughly enjoyed reading his, his writing. Um, and Tom, um, I'm, let me give you a, a minute here to introduce yourself as well. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. I really appreciate it. Thanks for those kind of words. Uh, so my name's uh, Tom Tungus. I um, I was a startup. I found a startup when I was about 17. I worked at a company called Appy and then went public and then uh, was at Google from 05 to 08 and joined Redpoint about 14 and a half years ago and have been writing at tomtungus.com ever since and really love to apply metrics to businesses like, like you all. So thrilled to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. Great to have you, Tom. So a lot's changed, obviously, over the last year. Um, what kind of operational metrics are you guys paying attention to most today? And how has that changed over the last uh, 12, 18 months? Yeah, a lot has changed. I mean, you've got, I think the, the best way to sort of describe it is you've got the forward multiples for publicly traded software companies have basically fallen 70% from their highs. Um, and that's across every single quartile. And uh, to summarize it, the ethos in the investor market has changed from growth at all costs to growth and efficiency. Uh, and in fact, if you uh, ran a linear regression on the highest correlating factors to a forward multiple for a publicly traded company. And for the first time since I've been running those analyses, it's uh, net income, so it's profitability. So you could even say that profitability at this point, at least in the later stages of the market are probably more important than, um, than they've ever been and probably more important than growth. For a long time, we were looking at pure ARR and, and sales efficiency as sort of the key metrics to just kind of understand at a high level how a business was doing. Uh, and that's because like ARR growth, obviously, how fast is it the business is growing? And then sales efficiency encompasses a lot of different metrics. It encompasses gross margin, encompasses gross churn and net churn and uh, net dollar retention. I think that the place where we're starting to pay much more attention are the second order metrics now. So there's this, uh, you know, total ARR uh, divided by total cumulative spend. It's sort of this, this burn metric that I think at a high level sort of gives a sense of efficiency. But the next level are things around like, um, pipeline to quota ratio. So a lot of VPs of sales have been operating businesses in the last 12 to 36 months with 3x pipe to quota coverage. Uh, so pipeline is the total value of, of potential bookings within a quarter divided by the sum total of the quota that's on the street for the account executives. And, you know, most, com most companies, most software companies are probably closing 15% of their SQ, the sales qualified, sales accepted leads. So typically you want to kind of operate with a five to six, but just because of the way the market's been going, many, many heads of sales and many companies have been operating about three X. And I, I think what we're really looking for now are smaller sales teams operating with significantly higher uh, quarter coverage ratios. And that's mainly because uh, sales cycles are lengthening. So if you look across most businesses, you're actually seeing uh, when we surveyed um, potential buyers and looked across our portfolio, most software companies are needing to have three to four extra conversations in order to close a deal. And so the, the better the pipeline coverage, the, the greater likelihood you actually hit your number. The, you know, the, the second thing that we're really looking for, and I think broadly what's going on in the ecosystem is a real preference for product-led growth. And uh, the reason that's the case, is, let me pull up a slide, but um, the reason that's the case is that the, the sales efficiency for publicly tra traded software companies has just been going down over time. And um, that's just, we, we can kind of talk about that. But as a result of this, like if, you, if you're sort of facing a secular decrease in your efficiency or secular increase in your cost of customer acquisition, irrespective of what kind of a business you are, you're going to look for some kind of discontinuity to, to change the game when it comes to acquiring new customers. Yeah. So is the takeaway here that um, when you're evaluating a new investment, that if a company has ARR growth, that's a little bit less um, than it may have been previously, let's say it was doubling year over year and now it's down at 
Is that something where you'll accept that in, in terms of making the decision in exchange for some of these new metrics? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think like, so when I started in venture in, you know, 08 and 2010, like the top decile companies were, were 3X and they were going like one to three. That was a really good number. And then they went one to four and then one to five. And then occasionally you see like a one to six, one to seven in ARR year over year. Um, and that was really sort of enabled by capital markets, I think, uh, and new motions, but people were willing to take significant, uh, early stage investors were willing to take, except inefficient businesses in, if you had those growth rates. And now um, I think you'd, you'd rather see a company growing like one to four with say a 16 month payback than you would a one to six with like a 36 month payback. Um, okay. So yeah, you really need both. And, and the reason is we're thinking about the Series B investor and the Series C investor, and we're thinking about they're really going to price the company as a function of a forward ARR, ARR, forward ARR. And that multiple 12 months ago was like 100 to 125 times ARR. So if you were 2 million in ARR business growing at some great rate, you were probably trading at like, you know, two, three, 400 pre, sometimes higher. Some of these companies traded in the billions. Um, and that's not going to happen anymore. Uh, <laughs> those numbers have come down a long way because like, I mean, you've got many of these public companies that are now trading at four to five times forward, which means if they're doing 400 million a year in revenue, you know, it's a $2 billion business. And so investing in a 2 million AR company at a billion post is sort of a tough, tough thing to sell because you just can't, you can't underwrite the return. Uh, and so, yeah, so efficiency matters a whole lot. I think the one sort of unusual pattern, I, I talked with Lee, um, Lee Kirkpatrick was the CFO at, at Twilio. Uh, he's no longer there, but um, talked to him early this summer about sort of lessons learned managing and operating companies through downturns because he's this is totally his third or fourth business. And one interesting pattern that I haven't seen in market, but I thought I would have seen it, is a reduction in R and D personnel. So um, a reduction in R and D spend in order to improve the efficiency while keeping the sales and marketing teams uh, hiring and going. And his advice was. During a downturn like this, it's not product differentiation that's ultimately going to differentiate a company. It's it's just ARR growth. And so if you're purely PLG, maybe that's not terrible, that's terrible advice or not sage advice. But if you're a sales and marketing driven company, stopping hiring or you know, cutting some of the R and D team in order to to improve the efficiency of the business and cut net burn might be something to consider. So I gotta imagine that if you're cutting early and then rebuilding from there that your efficiency, the first derivative of that efficiency is going to be positive. On the other hand, if you're cutting in response to market conditions, you may be kind of chasing yourself kind of down the market. Is that a dynamic that you, you perceive in the market today? Yeah, I think, um, I think there are definitely some companies who are looking to lengthen runway. And at the beginning of sort of the crash, the recession, whatever you want to call it, the advice coming from VCs, me included, was you needed 12 to 18 months of runway. And now where I think people are is you really want to have 24 uh, because this um, this recession seems like it's going to last longer. I mean, you can see like the Fed's positioning at the um, during their press conference, like Mr. Powell, Jerome, <laughs> it was very, very hawkish. Uh, and and so it seems like interest rates are going to be significantly higher. They probably, you know, the Fed funds rate probably starts with a five. Um, and so that means that the capital markets are going to be tighter, which means if you're sitting at a high valuation or as a on a, on a pure multiple basis, you really you need time to be able to grow. And again, so that's why I sort of in, encouraging people to sort of um, to invest in sales and marketing and maybe pause or uh, slow down the, the R&D hiring in order to just grow into the valuation. So you're at a place where you can raise it a flat, uh, a flat round, which, I, you know, for many of these companies would be an incredible outcome. Yeah. So, so if I think of NDR as probably being, you know, the most powerful metric that we've discussed, you know, over the last five plus years, which, which kind of metric would you point folks to, to say, above all else, if you're fundraising, this is the one where you should really kind of make sure the investor understands that you're performing really well. Yeah, I think it's got to be sales efficiency or payback period. One is the inverse of the other. So they're the mm -hmm. same. Um but you really want to be, so I, I surveyed 550 companies and the top quartile companies were sort of operating between 14 to 18 months payback on a gross margin adjusted basis. And so if you're there and you've got a growth rate of like 3X plus, you're in a great position, provided you're not sitting on some huge post. Um, and yeah, so I think that's great. I think the other thing that's really important 
an environment like this is shorter sales cycles. So if you've got the option to get the sales velocity up, land and expand, as opposed to closing big deals, you're going to be in a much, much better position than you would be kind of elephant hunting. But yeah. So, so, so that's a little bit tricky because the I, you just showed us a, a graphic where sales efficiency has actually been declining and declining for a fairly significant period. What's what's behind that and how how might one think about countering that? Yeah, so I think it's competition. I mean, so you've got um, anytime there's sort of a new distribution channel, you've got lots of slack in that distribution channel, which means people can figure out ways to be incredibly efficient. You think about like Google when it came out or the mobile app stores or the social networks or, you know, Salesforce app exchange, the AWS, you know, tackles um, of the world. And over time, people figure out how to optimize them and optimize them and optimize them. At the same time, the U.S. venture capital industry has grown 40x in size over the last 10 years. And um, 80 to 85 percent of that is going in B2B software, either in infrastructure applications. And so you've really had, you know, quite a bit of capital sales and marketing capital that's going in. To helping these companies grow. And I'm sure all of us are receiving many more emails from vendors. Uh, and you can see it in your inbox. And so the net result of that is each marketing, um, each marketing channel becomes less efficient. And so you've got to spend more in order to, to reach your end customer because you're competing with more people. And, and we've had a number of new marketing channels that have become phenomenal over the last decade. Is that petering out or does that opportunity still remain? Well, you're always going to be looking for new marketing channels, but like open source was a huge one, right? That one was really big, particularly in the last decade. You've had a handful of publicly traded companies uh, and that was super capital efficient. Uh, you had the the cloud vendors, uh, the cloud platforms were, were really important, um, but now they're starting to saturate. And so people over the last couple of years have really been pushing towards product-led growth. Um, and this is the idea of having the product do the qualification work that say a BDR might or having the user ultimately end up doing it in order to drive efficiencies. Um, and so I, you know, many of the companies that I work with, and I'm sure many of the companies that you work with are either contemplating or trying to transition to this. You know, at a high level, the way I think about marketing or customer acquisition is it's really sort of like a hedge fund. You wanna have a portfolio of different customer acquisition strategies. Some of them are sales led, some of them are marketing led, some of them are calling product led. And the greater the diversity in your portfolio, uh, the more you can experiment and, and the more consistent you can, you can run your go-to-market engine. So I think it's sort of inevitable that most companies will have a PLG motion. So is it fair to say that that's, that's almost a requirement now uh, in raising capital to have a strong story? Yeah. PLG? Uh, absolutely. Unless you've got an inside motion where, you know, you're closing 20 to 40K ACV deals, sub 45 day sales cycles and great NDR. I think those are the two places you really want to be. Um, yeah. I, I think if you're trying to sell like 150 to 500 K deals with nine to 12 or 18 month sales cycles, it's going to be a tough, tough, tough road. Yeah. And, and before there are kind of the high level metrics that we're all familiar with before those become evident, um, can you give some examples of PLG metrics that either in product usability or stuff that actually hits the top line um, that entrepreneurs, that management teams can really compel an investor with? Yeah. So, you know, if you start PLG and you're really going after an individual, like a lot of the top decile PLG companies are seeing net dollar retentions of 180 to 200%, 220%. So I've seen a lot of that. And that's because you're starting with like one seat, right? And so if you start with one seat and then somebody convinces a second person, a third person, you got pretty stellar NDR. Um, actually, Bill Bench, I was talking to him uh, on off on my office hour show and he was saying he expects most companies to get to about 200% net dollar retention in the next decade. That was kind of his bold prediction as a result of PLG. Um, so net dollar retention is definitely one. I think the second thing that's really important is you really, you need somebody who's focused on funnel optimization through products. So some people call that a growth marketing manager. Um, and what I found there is like the top decile of, or top quartile of companies are able to close 4% of people who sign up to a paying seat with without sales assistance if you if you have sales assistance uh or like some people have csam's customer support account managers where they they walk you through what the product does and sort of help you then you're sort of looking at like 15 to 20 percent in the top quartile so those would be the method if and then the last part would just be tr raw traffic growth like an ability to, to drive the top of the funnel and if you if you're running a 
a true PLG business, and if top quartile conversion rates are 4%, you need a pretty large top of the funnel in order to be able to consistently grow, right? So that's why you look at like businesses like Figma, who are Notion, like the end user numbers are in the hundreds of millions um, and they're able to grow. And, and so that works. But if you're selling a niche product, PLG may be, may be a tougher way of, of building a business. And, and for those companies that are not PLG instrumented today, is this something that it's a must? You've got to change how you think about your business. You've got to pivot. You've got to pursue PLG. I think it's something, look, it's a, it's a CEO and board level decision. It's probably a multi, it's, I would think it's a three to a four year project. So I think it's of that scale. Uh, and I think the, the, the companies that have done it the best historically have, have sort of forked the company and divided it in two. So they created like a, a tiger team or some subset of the team to give them free reign in order to move really quickly. A lot of the times when you're moving into PLG, you are jettisoning some of the features of the core product. Um, you might even fork the code base in order to kind of get to a particular place faster. And, um, and the reason to do that is a PLG motion is going to demand different priorities from a product roadmap than a sales-led motion. When a, when a seller finds a customer, they're going to promise them a little bit more than they actually have. And then they come have a product and say, look, in order to close this account, we need, we need to do this. The PLG motions are not focused on individual customers they are focused on optimizing the conversion of the masses. And so there's this natural tension that exists between sales led and, and product led companies. Um, some people are able to manage both. Some people sort of bifurcate the organization, but, but yeah, it, it, you know, at a high level, it is a strategic level decision. It is a multi-year process. It requires hiring people that can most of the time, very different DNA than already exists inside the company. And uh, it's an iterative process in a way because it's not so so much a science yet, the way that like the AE to BDR motion was canonicalized by Salesforce. It's much more iterative for many of these companies. And so it takes longer. And, and how important is it in your mind that, that you make that transition by hiring folks who have PLG experience versus is this a new enough uh, dynamic where, you know, the inexperienced person is gonna be able to think this through in an ivory tower way and then pull it off. I, it all depends on what your what your runway is, right? Uh, if you've got two years of runway and you need to show a PLG motion working in the next 12 months, you might buy a company that's excellent at PLG just to get that DNA inside of the company. You don't have the time to educate people on your dime. Um, and so uh, I, th I think most of the time, I can't think of a single instance where I've seen somebody sort of build that discipline internally. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So in a lot of cases, this really boils down to what kind of runway do you have at this point? Yeah. Because you're, you're probably talking about, I don't know, six months, maybe nine months of product development. Well, first you've got three to four months of hiring the team. Then you've got, you know, two to three quarters of product development. So you're already looking at a year. And then it, in the beginning, you're going to be iterating. You probably need four quarters of that to kind of get to any kind of statistical significance of a scale of what's going on in the funnel. And you're probably not looking at a meaningful ARR contribution until year three or four, which is why I said it's like a year four project. Um, and so like you really, um, you either need to have the team like hits the ground running <laughs> as soon as possible. And within 18 months, start showing, you know, 500K in ARR, a million in ARR, or you need to have three or four, you need to have the expectation it's going to take you three or four years to get to two to five in ARR. And, and given the current landscape, do you see, I'm, I'm imagining a later stage company um, that does need to head in this direction. Is the early stage market such that there are now a number of companies that you can go acquire to get that expertise? Or is the early stage market still strong enough where these companies are not available to be acquired? No, aqua hires are, are way up. I, I think you're going to see that through this year. I think you're going to see a lot of uh, private equity acquisitions too. Um, so they definitely exist. And the seed in the Series A, market on the whole is probably a pre-money valuation is probably down 50 to 60%. So there's still the preference stack. I think you probably have to cover in the case of an acquisition. And maybe there's a, an issue when it comes to, um, to covering that in terms of uh, the, the ultimate price, but I, it could be an interesting time to do it, particularly if you've got a lot of cash on the balance sheet, or you can use a lot of companies have been using venture debt in order to finance acquisitions. And so that yeah. might be another path. 
Yeah. So um, switching gears slightly, uh, you've discussed um, the book Anti-Fragile by Nassim Tlaib. Um, and it certainly seems like one of the elements of, of being anti-fragile is having a whole lot of cash, as we just discussed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, not, not every company is in that situation. Are there other elements that you might think about building into a business that allows it to be more resilient in difficult times? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I work with uh, was one very creative founder. And... Uh, he shifted his go-to-market strategy to go after non-cyclical businesses as end customers. Uh, and his idea was like, if you look at the performance of cyclical, like technology or high growth companies, all of those sectors are down like 40, 50, 60, 70%. But if you look at non-cyclicals like utilities or oil and gas or um, uh, consumer non-discretionary, those, those pub the prices or those values of, uh, in the public market have basically remained the same. They might even be up 10 or 20%. And so those are the businesses that are growing and spending more money on data infrastructure or whatever it is. And so retooling the go-to-market strategy to pursue those sectors because they're growing faster, not necessarily the entire sales and marketing team to go after, but reprioritizing the outbound efforts to go after those, I think is um, could be a wise decision depending on the kind of product and company you're building. Yeah, yeah. And, and similar to going from an SLG to a PLG strategy, how do you think about a company retooling, going after a non-cyclical customer versus a cyclical customer? Uh, you know, PLG, it's tough because you are trying to get the biggest possible funnel at the top. And so you may not, maybe you're, it's sort of, it, it's harder to kind of uh, shift traffic or decide which traffic you're going to accept unless you've got paid spend behind the PLG and you're shifting your, your spend to those kinds of categories. So it may be tougher there. Um, but the marketing campaigns and like the content that you do and the webinars and the templates or stuff inside of products, I, I, I have to say, I have not seen that in market. I haven't seen like a horizontal SaaS company start building templates for non-cyclical businesses. Maybe it'll happen. But. Yeah. And, and in your investment process today is that cyclical versus non-cyclical customer. Is that a, is that a key uh, factor? Yeah. The health of the buyer base is super important. I remember I was working with a company in 2015, 2016, when there was a, there was a flash crash in the market. The public multiples fell 57% in a day. And, um, and then it sort of impacted the private markets. And all of a sudden, a big swath of the B2C, like the high growth B2C startups went out of business or were contracting meaningfully. It was about 50% of our customer base. Um, and so we saw a significant contraction. And so that taught me the lesson of, you really understand who you're selling to and how financially stable they are. Um, you know, After you're an investor, maybe you can persuade uh, to sort of diversify, but when you're looking at it, you've really got to understand. And so um, software companies selling to restaurants or other like low, low gross margin businesses or net margin businesses, those are those are tougher to invest in today because the health of the underlying customer base may not be as strong as it say was a year ago. Yeah. And, and how willing are you to look through that cyclicality? Meaning I can imagine you're selling to, you know, one of these businesses that, that is in difficult straits today, but we postulate on the other side of, of inflation, that being strong. Is that I, not. <laughs> I think it's tough because, uh, you know, I'm not a macro guy. Um, I mean, we're all sort of macro thrust into being all macroeconomic um, people, armchair quarterback uh, today, but it's really tough to know like when those categories are going to come back and, you know, whether the Fed's policy to break inflation is, is actually going to do it and on what time frame. And if you were, say, willing to do that, then I think you'd have to come up with an agreement with the company that you would invest in the company and they would keep burn low until the point in time in which you really saw that sector come back. So if you were investing in a vertical software company for restaurants, for example, you'd probably want the company to operate at near cash flow break even for the next 12 to 18 months and then have the agreement that at that point you can start to ramp up the burn. Sounds good. So, so in, in the uh, choice between looking through that cyclicality versus changing the target, it sounds like you're endorsing more changing the target market. I would, yeah, for sure. Why, why take the risk if you don't need to? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, one of the things that I wanted to touch on here, just uh, uh, kind of it's something that's been discussed quite a bit, which is Web3. Um, and uh, I, I'd be remiss without asking a question about Web3. Can you give us kind of 
you know, the most compelling or most kind of tangible elements of Web3 um, that you're excited about going forward? Yeah, I mean, what a day. I mean, you got this Binance FTX debacle happening in the background. Um, you know, it's a third big sort of uh, short squeeze that's happened this year. And so I think coming out of this in Q4 and Q1, you're going to see a lot of negative sentiment in and around Web3. Um, you know, th I think there are four big innovations out of Web3. The first are stable coins, uh, which are going to change the way that money moves. Uh, and, you know, Western Union is moving in this direction. Uh, the U.S., I think in the next five or 10 years, we'll have a CBDC, a central bank digital coin. Um, the second innovation, I think, is an end run. Um, is an end run around the IPO process. About 25 years ago, companies could go public with 25 million in trailing. And these micro caps would be supported on the, on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. And I think the, the ICOs and the, the way to go public through crypto is sort of um, you know, today you've got to have um, 150 in trailing, probably 12 years of operating. And so we need sort of a micro cap exchange. I look at the ICO market as, as basically that, which replicates the China next market or the TSX or the ASX and other geos. The third big innovation is paying your customers in equity effectively. Um, and sort of how do you bootstrap network effects by making people owners in the businesses that, that they're using? Um, and then the last part of the decentralized databases. Uh, so, you know, at a high level, look, th those are the four big innovations. I think the, the category that I'm most interested in today is um, there's, it's in Web3 marketing, actually. I, I think that, you know, there's about $3 trillion of market cap uh, tied to online advertising. And the, the basis of that is, is a, a file in your browser that's called a cookie. And that cookie is going away. Uh, so it cost Facebook, Apple got rid of it for Facebook in Q2. It cost them $10 billion in a quarter. It's costing them more. Google is going to stop supporting the third-party cookie at the end of, it was supposed to be at the end of this year, but it's going to be the end of next year. And so I think um, the decentralized databases and the wallet and the idea of NFTs are going to replace the cookie and really sort of fundamentally change the way that online advertising works. And so I'm, I'm through, I'm, you know, uh, online marketing has sort of been a dead category for the last 10 or 15 years from a venture investor's point of view because of the hegemony of Google and Facebook. And I think now you're seeing uh, a seismic shift and an opportunity to create a new new class of companies there. Great. Well, Tom, uh, we've, we've come to the end here. Uh, great comments. Super interesting. My takeaway here is that companies really should be focusing on, on the details, kind of the elements that make up sales efficiency. I think that was one point you made. Product-led growth, the importance of having product-led growth strategy. Thirdly, thinking about your customer targets, cyclical versus non-cyclical. Um, and it sounds like the last point here is, is really thinking about what marketing canvases are not saturated. Um, and, and maybe some of those are, are Web3 related. Thank you so much for the excellent questions, Jim. I really enjoyed it and it's a privilege to be here. Thanks, Tom.